The workshops we conducted with Graffiti Theatre were part of a project called Read On, which is a 48-month European project that's being delivered over seven partner organisations across six EU countries. Read On was undertaken with the support of the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union and the Arts Council. This interview was supposed to take place at the West Cork Literary Festival, but because of COVID-19, it's being held online instead. Our workshops involved young people working with course facilitators to analyse texts, develop interview skills, practice these skills on authors, and take a role in presenting authors and their work to the broader public. Lovely. Cool, thank you for introducing that, Sophie. Uh, I'm Julie, and I'm the Creative Learning Coordinator for Graffiti Theatre Company. And this week, I've had the pleasure of working with the participants here to do some interview training and to read Deidre's brilliant book um, alongside Caitlin. Yes, uh, I'm Caitlin Leahy. I am a local YA writer who wrote Tuesdays Are Just As Bad. And I am delighted to uh, work with Graffiti and to uh, speak to Deirdre. <laughs> and thanks so much for joining us, Deirdre. It's really lovely to have you here. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm delighted. Great. So I'm going to hand you over to Molly and Sloan, and they're going to take the, the interview for us today. Okay, fantastic. Good. Hi, Deirdre. How are you? Hi, Molly. I'm good. I really like your bookshelf. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's actually my parents. I kind of like I stole it because they didn't have room in their in their bedroom. So it's yours now. <laughs> it's like, don't mind that. Um, how's lockdown treating you anyway? Um, it's okay. Like, I mean, it's up and down and it's gone on for a while now. Um, but I'm, I'm quite lucky in that like anyone I know who had it has recovered. Um, yeah. and so far, like kind of keeping safe and um, I hope, I hope you are too. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's the main thing as long as yeah. everyone's safe and stuff. Um, so do you have an extract of the book that you'd like to read to us? Yeah, um, I normally I normally read the beginning, but um, I thought I might actually uh, go wild because um, it's, it's a whole new world um, and read uh, chapter 13, um, the creepiest chapter. Um, so, yeah, it's um, I think it'll give like a good flavor of kind of the tone of it. OK, perfect. So, um, are you guys OK if I start now? Yeah. OK, perfect. Um, wild cherry, prepare the stalks of droops to soothe their bind. I wake up, sweating like I have been running. Rain beats on the windows, dreams of foxes interspersed with screams. We're high up, but the mountains here cast shadows day and night. When we told Brian about the skull we found, he laughed at us. Gently, but he laughed. Typical dad, he said. He didn't ever open half the trunks he bought at the estate sales. His hand outstretched. I'll give it to the guards though, just in case. He tucked the pitted bone into his satchel. The light caught grooves upon it, carved by time or maybe something else. The moon is waxing, fatter slices building, skulls in Catelyn's room of things long dead. I blink and try to think of salt and safety. My ears strain for the breathy creak of pipes. What can my sister hear that I can't hear? Girls go missing all the time in Ireland. You hear about the right ones on the news, the ones with parents, girls who come from money, pale skinned, pretty, missed. I've shared the photos, seen the posters peeling on the lampposts, bins and walls, sellotaped or glued. The pictures bleeding into the text with rainfall, printed out by families or friends, loving, hopeless hands that clutch at nothing. And in time, they might be found in isolated places. The mountains that we drive through on the bus. I picture them, the faint trodden paths from years of feet that line the slopes like slender threads a foot's breadth wide through bush and grass like veins upon a leaf. You have to know or really look to notice. It would be the same, I think, with bodies. You'd have to look but mightn't think to look. I comb my fingers through my damp blank hair. So many missing girls, lines and lines of them like beads on string. Why do they haunt me when they're not my business? Why is it so warm here at night? Everything outside is icy freezing. The pelt of rain against the window panes. I must ask Brian to turn the heating off. I end up kicking blankets, tossing, turning. I'm thinking of the other girl I know once lived near here, Helen Gork. 
Catelyn told me at the time that people only cared because she was hot and was she even hot like Maddie really? Anyone can look that way in a photo from the right angle with the right filter. A girl can turn into an ellipsis so easily. Yeah, there we go. Thank you so much. That's fab. Um, yeah, it's weird. It just, it's so weird to be reading it on a Zoom call. <laughs> Do you know, it's, it's, it's different, but yeah, I, I hope you liked it. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really great. And it was so like different from other YA books I've read. So I was wondering, like, what was your inspiration um, behind it? Well, um, there are writers that I really like. Like, I like a lot of horror writers and um, particular kind of writers, um, female horror writers. Like, I really like, um, like this one writer called Shirley Jackson. Um, She's amazing and I'm kind of, I'm very drawn to ghost stories um, and there are like, there are some children's writers kind of like Edith Nesbitt who wrote The Railway Children who like would have also written horror stories so I don't know if that's, if that's a thing, if people who write for younger readers um, also like to scare people maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, I kind of, um, with it I wanted to do a kind of a dark, um, a dark reworking of something and I think a lot of the time in books it's about someone with a secret but as you kind of grow in the world you kind of know everyone has something we all have our own things and no one's are more important than anyone else's and I kind of wanted to like make a town where instead of like one chosen person you know kind of that it was, it was everyone. We all, like there are layers, and everyone has their own thing going on. And once I kind of stumbled on the character of Maddie, um, and her relationship to Catelyn, and that thing of like being, being an identical twin, but wanting to assert your individuality, and kind of feeling like you live with a slightly, again, like a reflection of yourself through a slightly better filter or something. Um, and I thought that would be a really interesting way to explore um, the anxiety that comes with trying new things and the anxiety that comes with discovering aspects of who you are, like your sexuality um, or coping with anxiety. Um, so that kind of like, I do tend to start from character, but the gothic aspect of it was also there very early on. Thank you. Um, just kind of, Sorry, two seconds. I have the question in my head. <laughs> um, what made you decide to set it in, like, you know, Ballyfran, the small town in Galway, that and have the characters move from Cork to there? Um, so my um, Ballyfran is a made-up town, um, and I really like this. Now, I mean, God, it's dated. Like, in some ways, it's dated badly, but I still do like it. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So um, Ballyfran is like just it's Hellmouth, like Bailifran. Um, so I kind of wanted to reference that. I also, I didn't want to draw on a real place, although there are aspects of real places in it, um, like small towns in Connemara. My cousins come from this place called Woodford. Um, and I kind of thought about that a bit. They live in a very rambling old house covered in ivy. Um, and I was thinking of that, like that kind of journey to a small town and like watching kind of the house become sparser and sparser and sparser until you come into a village. Um, and then, yeah, and I wanted to, I wanted to be able to build it from the ground up. And I felt like if I started with an actual place that I'd have more of a responsibility, um, I knew I wanted them to have a big change and I grew up in Galway, but I felt like Galway to outside Galway wasn't a big enough change. And my husband is from Cork and he, um, I remember the first time that I like visited it with him, I was so struck by the difference of the landscape, like his dad's a farmer and there were these lush green fields and my granddad's a farmer, but the fields were not as lush, you know, and I kind of wanted that. I wanted that difference in the landscape. And I do think that like the place that you're from does shape you in a way. And when you move, you have to kind of adapt to a different set of people, a different culture and a different mindset, even if it's within the same country. Um, so I wanted to, um, I wanted to unsettle and displace them. And I thought that the story that I wanted to tell would be easier 
if they had that sense of displacement from the very beginning, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And, you know, with the magic, I really liked that sort of um, aspect of it. And I was wondering, is it, did you make it up? Is it based in some sort of old Celtic magic or? I'm so glad that you thought that. No, <laughs> no, I made it. I made it up. These are really good questions, by the way. Well done, guys. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I completely made it up. Um, I did draw on, like, I read a lot about her herbology. Um, I read a lot about ritual magic. But what um, my magical systems, I'm a writer who starts from character. So I don't kind of want to write a book about witches. I want to write a book about a girl you know, and like, the more I get to know her, the more it becomes apparent what's going to happen over the course of this. So my magic is very character based. So say, for example, Maddie, like, she's someone who likes to do the practical thing, and kind of to understand the bargain that's being made when she goes into something. Like she doesn't just leap head first the way that Catelyn does. So her brand of magic is kind of like, it's like an equation, you put something in, you get something out and sometimes what you put in might be blood or hair or teeth like it's not it mightn't always be pretty but you're fairly sure that when you make that sacrifice you know what you're giving up um whereas prayer magic would be for people who are a little bit more spontaneous a little bit more adventurous and don't think about the consequences as much because prayer magic is like a door that opens and a magic hand comes through it and does the thing you wanted to do but the door never fully closes and the hand might come back and want something from you. So it's a bigger risk. And then the third kind of magic is um, blood magic. So it's the magic that we get from preying off other people, you know, and there are people who take, you know, there are introverted people who take their power from themselves. There are extroverted people who take their power from a sense of community and interaction with other people. And then there are people who exploit other people and prey upon them. And that's something that you have to look at as well. So I kind of wanted the magical systems to reflect that. And for the people who have a talent for each particular magic, like it's guided by their personality, but also the decision to engage with that particular kind of magic will shape you in ways as well. If that makes sense. I've thought about it a lot. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, what was the inspiration for the character of Lon? Do you know who he was? Um, <laughs> um, not gonna get too personal um, <laughs> oh, yeah. no um i uh do you know twilight yeah. um so when i um when twilight was big i was kind of you know everyone was reading it and i was reading it and i always kind of i like thought about the people that i had encountered that acted like that and how those relationships had progressed and it wasn't a romantic dream. It was quite, you know, it was not okay. Um, and I thought about how easy it is to be swept up in love um, and kind of, and a romantic story. And I mean, like everyone who like, well, not everyone, I mean, some people like have written very good essays about it and stuff, but a lot of people who read Twilight bought so hard into the love because it was portrayed as a love story. But if you do scratch the surface, there are a lot of problematic things happening under there. So I kind of, I suppose I wanted like Catelyn to be the person who was, you know, kind of fully heart invested, just really believing in it. And Maddie to be the kind of, well, actually, you know, um, and Lon, Lon was there to serve the female characters. So he kind of, he became who I needed him to be to teach them what I wanted them to learn if that makes sense. Like I do kind of, I do tend to find um, like female characters easier to read and identify with. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah. Thank um, you. I was also wondering with the girls, why you decided to make them twins and what sort of significance that had for you? Um, well, it's kind of the, like what I talked about earlier a little bit like that, that reflection. But I also like, um, I had, well, I still have, like I'm very close to her still, but I had a very close friend growing up and it's a very specific type of relationship when your friendship transitions from childhood into adulthood. And I think adolescence, when you're going through an awful lot, 
is a particularly, it's a particularly interesting time for a long lasting friendship because there are changes that happen and lessons that are learned and like, you know, kind of, and you can't help if you're very close to someone, but compare yourself to them, which can lead to kind of difficulty for, you know, kind of anyone really like, because we can't like, we can't measure ourselves by other people. Like you'd be driven mad. <laughs> um, but uh, so I kind of wanted to almost to impose that comparison and that anxiety on Madeline but also to give her a deep bank of love. Like, I mean, they love each other and they have a real and nourishing friendship underneath all of the toxicity that takes place in the book. And kind of the value of that and the value of sisterhood is something I really did want to explore. Great, thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, what's your writing process like? You know? So it varies. Um, I kind of, Say at the moment, um, I would, because I'm, I'm working um, remotely, I, I teach, so say I would finish my day's work and then I would, um, I'm doing edits and I'm working on something new. So I'm quite regimental about it because I don't have say eight hours in the day to write, I have maybe three or four. So I would, for the proof, I make a list and I say exactly what I have to go through and I go through that. And when it's done, I can start the fun bit, which is making things up. Um, so for the fun bit, what I do is at the moment, I'm finding reading for half an hour, um, reading a book, not something that has to do with what I'm writing, just a good story to kind of remind me why books are good. Um, and then, and to kind of break, um, break the part of my brain that needs to fix all of the problems away from the part of my brain that needs to make up the nice thing, if that makes sense. Um, and then I set a timer and I write for half an hour and then I read back over what I've written and I read it aloud and I edit it. And that's my writing process right now. It can look different. Um, I think every project demands something different. Um, with the book that I'm proofreading at the moment, which is called Savage Her Reply um, and is out in October, I would have done, um, I would have done reading for about a year before I started writing it. And that was very different to other books where I kind of launched in head first and did my research on the way. Um, and I think like and not to sound too like arty or whatever about it but like a project teaches you how to write it you know what I mean but like you'll kind of know if you're in tune with what you're making what it needs from you and then it's up to you to kind of work out how that can fit into your life because I mean you guys are at school and then you'll be at college you know I mean I know it's like it's remote now but like there's still loads of pressure and loads of strain on you and like I mean there's the day-to-day -day coping with you know this global pandemic um no big deal but you know kind of like you have to find a way to make what you want to make without exhausting yourself without burning yourself out and I think the, the best way to write is to develop a consistent writing practice. So I always start with something achievable. And if I set a timer for half an hour, I might write for two, but that's up to me. I can stop at half an hour and it's enough. You know, and I think kind of um, that like, that being kind to yourself and not trying to push yourself to 3 a.m. Unless like, I mean, there are times when you'll absolutely need to do that if you have deadlines and things. But I think, you know, that can't like, you need to maintain it and I've built a practice that I can maintain and that's something I've worked hard at and um, kind of I've tried I've tried a lot of different things um, I also weirdly reward myself with like jelly beans um, like a little child um, but like I just I love jelly beans so sometimes if I can't write I will buy myself a bag of them and be like you just sit down and then you can have these and it is it's essentially dog training for an adult woman but um it works so I thought I would pass it on in case jelly beans are anyone else's cup of tea <laughs> Anyways, thanks thanks that was great I appreciate the advice as well <laughs> that was good um 
another thing, did you have a sequel in mind when writing that would maybe deal with like uh, the twins' dad and Brian's dad and all that kind of background stuff? Yeah, I absolutely do. <laughs> um, initially, I wanted Perfectly Preventable Deaths to be three books and one to deal with each magical system. Because like, you know, like I've laid it out, there's like three there and Maddie kind of comes into herself. So book two would be kind of the next and the next. Um, but I ended up over the editing process incorporating a lot of what I would have put in book two in book one. And all of the questions about the twins dad, well, maybe not all of them, but many of them. Um, and the questions about the magical system, like they will be answered. Um, Hockey have contracted me to write a sequel for Perfectly Preventable Deaths, um, which I'm really excited to start soon. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted about that because I feel like it's a book that needs a companion book. Like the story is not finished when you reach the end. That's great. Looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good. This uh, might be a good time to open the, uh, que uh, the questions to audiences. Open the audience to questions. <laughs> we Hello, don't have a mic to pass around, so we'll just have to have people shout. <laughs> hey. Hello. I really enjoyed your book, by the way. I loved it. It was so good. And I, I was just wondering, um, apart from the, the fantastical aspects, maybe, maybe, I don't know, how much of the book was autobiographical? I, I don't want to. Um, oh, sorry. I, yeah, no, you're absolutely grand. And that's a really interesting question and one that writers and particularly women writers get asked a lot. Um, but I write fiction because I don't want to write nonfiction. Um, and yeah, I put an awful lot of myself and things that I've been through into the book. But um, I kind of feel like if I give everyone the water from the well, when I want to go back for the next book, there'll be nothing in there. Do you know if that makes sense? And I don't want to be, yeah. you know, I think it's a really good and a really interesting question. It's just one I don't want to answer very much. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I'm sorry. Any other questions from the audience, guys? Yeah. Ellie. Hello, Ellie. Hello, Nadia. I loved your book. Oh, thank and you so much. You're very welcome. And one of my favourite bits I think that I really enjoyed was the relationships and especially um, Madeline, like, revealing your sexuality, like, slowly mm -hmm. throughout it and not in, like, um, an issue-based way, not yes. necessarily. And I was wondering, about, like, especially I love, like, the descriptions of her, like, describing Una, especially at the start. And I was wondering like what that process was like for you because it was very true to like what I think like a teenage experience is like and um, I was wondering what that was like to write like from an adult perspective. Um, it actually was, um, it was lovely and I wanted to give her, um, I wanted her to have a friend who was in Catlin and like them falling in love was actually it wasn't something I planned like sometimes when you get to know a character really well um they kind of end up surprising you so I was writing Madeline and I was describing Una and then I just realized kind of like she realizes herself that she was falling in love with her and that this would kind of like, it's like, it's not a, like, I wanted her sexuality to be like a good, pure realization in her life, you know, um, because love is wonderful. And I know that there's more admin when it's queer love, like, you know, because you have to like come out and you have to kind of like deal with that aspect of kind of society, maybe not making it easy, but, um, yeah, I just, I really just wanted Una to be this, this force for good, but not also kind of like, I don't want her to meet the love of her life at 15 or 16, you know, and like every relationship you're on teaches you something. So while Una might be it for Madeline, like absolutely with her whole heart, Una, like it, like her heart isn't fully free, you know, and I think that like that reflected, um, some of like just some of my own complicated teenage love issues and stuff you know <laughs> but um I kind of I wanted it to be both good and murky you know <laughs> if that makes sense totally thank you thanks so much
Um, yeah, I really love the book as well. And I really like the structure, like the chapter names and like the kind of plants, like what did they kind of mean? Um, so I wanted, um, because as I like said, Madeline's magic is kind of equation-y, um, like yeah. it's based in the earth and it comes from yourself or it comes from like things that you use. I wanted to explore the folklore and the magical medicinal properties of plants plants and I wanted kind of in my head the chapter headings have been scribbled on jam jars by Mamo and the people that came before Mamo so it's kind of Madeline entering into the history of kind of what plants can do for humans but also of this collective wisdom that at the end of the book she finds herself a part of um, and each of the plants um, like, I mean, the, the properties tie a little bit into the themes of the chapter because, you know, kind of, it felt more like more organic and kind of nicer to do it that way a little. Yeah, that's really cool. That's so interesting. <laughs> I really enjoyed the gritty aspects, like the skulls and the fox and whatnot. Yeah. I was wondering why you decided to choose a castle, um, like an old ancient castle to set it in. Yeah, um, I wanted to, um, I wanted a place that was unsettling and not what you'd expect. And I kind of, because I do like writing, like I do like Gothic fiction, this journey to a castle was kind of interesting to me. And I wanted this, like this notion, like it's a patchwork castle that Brian's father has built from other castles that he kind of has visited and seen. So this kind of idea of like, a kind of a hybrid between something ancient and something modern and also a bit of a like a bit of a Frankenstein house so there are parts of their lives and parts of their history there but they're kind of sewn together with things that he's bought from estate sales and that gives them a great um like Brian has a lot of plausible ideas deniability then when they find the human skull because it's not like oh someone you know kind of my dad must have left that lying around it's like oh yeah it's probably not mine just, just holding it for a friend like mm -hmm. um but you know kind of I wanted to um yeah and I wanted to make their home unsettling and equally like when you're in a domestic space that sense of separation like if you're in a small house you can't really avoid the people that you live with but when your house gets bigger that becomes easier and if your house is enormous you could lose that connection to the people you love a little bit because it's an alien space as well as your domestic space and I think that's kind of that's a journey that Maddie goes on and like what happens to Catelyn in the end like ultimately happens in part of her own home and I thought that that made it kind of all the more horrific in a way yeah, that's thank you. I have one question. Okay. Cool. So I think for us, like a lot of the people here, they're youth theatre members or they're readers or performers and some writers um, as well and all kind of artists, I suppose, in, in different yeah. ways. I was just wondering if there was a moment for you, Deirdre, when you kind of started calling yourself a writer um there absolutely was and it wasn't until very late and I actually like like I can tell like the questions that you guys have asked um are really really good and I'm just I'm really grateful to have gotten the opportunity to speak with you so thank you um like thank you for giving my book um like so much care like it really like it means the world to me and I really appreciate it um I was as you might be able to tell, I don't know, but I was quite an anxious person um, growing up. And I still am sometimes. Um, but I didn't, although I always wrote, I would have found acting a lot easier to do than sharing my work. Because you know, you're you know, when you act, you're putting on a role, you're putting on someone else's personality like clothes. That's like it's very satisfying, but you're not giving of yourself in the same way that you are with writing. Um, and I, I love the nodding that I'm seeing. You <laughs> <laughs> love me. <laughs> um, but I, so when I started college, um, I was always looking at posters for Writers Society. 
but because writing was something that I held so close to my heart and it was such an important part of who I was, I barely shared it with anyone. I read the odd poem to my very closest friend, but did not, beyond that, share it with anyone and I did not feel comfortable doing so. And then I got to my final year of college and I kind of felt like, this is really, really important to me and I can't name it and I can't share it, but why can't I? Like, can I not just be a bit braver and try? And so I did. And I, the first time that I read a poem that I'd written in public, um, like my hands were like full on shaking. I was sweating, it was not pretty, um, <laughs> but like, like people welcomed me and this idea that I'd had that when I shared my work that people would like kick me out of writing for not being good enough or not being like John Banville. Like there were no John Banvilles in writer's talk when I was, you know, like it's just like you build up these walls for yourself and then you realize they don't exist. Um, and last night I um, did a Zoom quiz um, with one of my very, very closest friends. And she is a woman that I met in Writer's Sock and she is the first person that ever published me and I dedicated Tangleweed and Brown to her um, because that is the difference that it made in my life, that like welcome and that feeling of acceptance. Um, so that's when I started thinking of myself as a writer. I first called myself a writer after I, had, after I knew Prim was getting published. I was on the bus up or the train up to Belfast and it got stalled and there were these businessmen and they were um, really fancy and they were talking about finance and numbers and Switzerland and businessmen things. And um, we got talking because it was a really long train journey. And I was going up to do my first paid gig like this to talk as a writer. And they asked me what I did. And I said, I'm a writer. And I still remember it. And they looked at me and I was like, I have the best job at this table <laughs> and it just it like it freed me like and I mean I did not have the most lucrative job at that table um but it was just it was a really it was a really powerful moment and once I claimed that space for myself I found it easier and I do tend to use um I use the word writer to describe myself not author and I do that deliberately and the reason that I do is an author is dependent on gatekeepers you need a publisher to become an author. You do not need anything beyond a pen and a heart to be a writer. You know, that's, that's a power that you have. You get to decide that. And I, like, it, it means too much to me to be a writer and to have made that decision that I am one to kind of give it to other people, if that makes sense. That's gorgeous and a really inspiring <laughs> story as well. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I have one more question. Sorry, if you don't mind. No, of course, um, Connor. I <laughs> open the question at this stage. No, you're, you're talking about your next book, and I was just wondering what that's about. What that, what is, if it's a similar genre or anything. Um, yeah, it is. Well, it's a bit similar. It's more similar to a book I wrote called Tangleweed and Brian than it is to Perfectly Preventable Deaths. So, um, my newest book, that my next book that's going to come out in October is called Savage Her Reply. And it is a retelling of the story of the children of Lear from Aoife's point of view. Um, because I felt like being forced to marry your dead sister's husband and parent his children at the age of 16 would be pretty annoying. And like, maybe you <laughs> kind of want to turn <laughs> your children into swans. And I felt like she got a bit of a raw deal. So I've kind of, I've had a, like, it's a very angry book and I don't, I tried really hard not to shy away from what she's done and the guilt that she feels because it's no small thing to hurt a child. But it's been very interesting, like visiting a different magical system and kind of researching the myth and lore of old Ireland. Um, and when I'm finished proofreading that, I'm going to get stuck into um, research and edits for the newest draft of the sequel to Perfectly Preventable Deaths. Sounds great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Thank Connor. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Is there any other pressing questions, guys? Or 
feeling satisfied I am anyway for sure thank you yeah. so much Deirdre that was absolutely brilliant like thank you million for joining us <laughs> it's just so easy like I you know kind of um it was yeah no it was a genuine pleasure to talk to you and thank you so much because you had the hard work to do I just have to talk about things I made up like you know <laughs> <laughs> amazing thanks so much